Our scripture today is found both in Romans and in Matthew, and we're going to start in the Romans text, uh, Romans 10, verses 11 through 15. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn there with me. If not, the verses will be on the screen behind me. So this is Romans 10, verses 11 through 15. As scripture says, for anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is the Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And then we'll turn to Matthew 28. This is Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Almighty God, what a gift it is to gather around your word to come in this space and time acknowledging that, that you have a word for us, uh, that, that this word is for all generations and for all time and for all people in all places, but it's also a specific word, your word for each of us as individuals. And so, Lord, I invite you to open our eyes that we would see, our ears that we would hear, our minds that we would come to know and understand your word and indeed your ultimate will. Open our hearts that we would fill, feel its power. And I pray, O oh God, that in response to this time around your word, you would open our hands as an offering of grace to your world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever had a moment where you realized that you had been the butt of an inside joke for an ongoing period of time without realizing it? That happens in my home sometimes, maybe uh, all too often if I actually began to process it. Uh, My kids and my wife have a way of coming together against me. Uh, of coming together uh, to make fun of me, uh, to, to poke and to prod at me. In fact, about a year and a half ago, I came to realize that I had been a part of a long-term systematic uh, hilaris, uh, hilarity that they were engaging in together. You see, um, I happened to be walking in the room as Addie Uh, opened a text message from me, and she began to laugh, and mom began to laugh, and they were laughing together because they were uh, acknowledging how foolish I am because I text with capitalization and punctuation. So, So I text message with capitalization and punctuation, and I did not know this. By the way, if, if you didn't know this, then you also have been a part uh, uh, of my life's story being uh, a butt of this joke, that if you text in capitalization and punctuation, it means that you're angry. Did you know this? It does. It means that you're angry. If you text with capitalization and punctuation, it means that you're angry. And so my kids uh, would receive a text message from me, and they would have to go through that like instantaneous like realization that this wasn't one of their friends that text with no capitalization and no punctuation, and that only when they are angry, like wanting to make a point and wanting to make sure you understood that then they use capitalization and punctuation. And so they told me that I needed to correct my behavior because I was presenting as foolish to all the world. (laughs) Now, here's the deal. 
Is it foolish for me to text in capitalization and punctuation? <laughs> so so we're, we're split on this decision. Uh, the, 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 and I, I believe that the younger that you get or the younger at heart, Barb, that you get, the more likely you are to believe that capitalization and punctuation is a no-no for text. So here's, here's the thing. Angler is all caps. Oh, okay. All right. So, so we're, we're working together. We're, we're in, we're in a, a learning environment. This is a collaborative moment. I appreciate this. So here's the thing. I would have never, ever, 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 ever have any way of understanding that some people in this world would believe capitalization and punctuation is anger unless someone told me about it. If no one ever told me about it, I would have never known because it's so crazy. It's absolutely <laughs> foolishness. So, so, so get, work with me here. How many times have you learned something that you come to realize? If, if no one would have ever told me this, I would have never known. There, there are so many aspects of our day-to-day -day life, lives where someone has to teach, someone has to tell, someone has to articulate so that we know. In fact, how many times in life do we, do we get caught in the headline and not understand the story? We're a consumption culture where we could see news and think that we know but we're, we don't really know because all we've done is read or, read or see or hear a headline. And how many times do we go to someone that actually knows, that actually has spent time invested in, in gaining deeper knowledge, and they inform us, and we realize that we needed a course correction because we only consumed partial information. All too often that happens in our day-to-day -day lives. We have a piece of the story, but not the story, and we assume we know, but we need someone to tell us. And if no one tells us, then we will continue operating in half-truths or failed understanding. We need someone to tell us. So what is it for us to hear the news of Scripture? You see, the, the news of, of Scripture according uh, to Romans chapter 10 is so fascinating. There are three different aspects uh, of news that are received uh, for anybody that, that, that digs into Romans chapter 10. The first is a news of salvation. That's good news. If you need to be saved and there is salvation for you, then it's good news to know that there is salvation. That's in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Salvation for you and for me. Uh, but it's not only salvation, it's also blessing. We're working our way backwards here. And if you have your Bibles or had, had them earlier, I do invite you to open to Romans 10 because we're going we're gonna to dig in more deeply. And actually, I invite you to grab a pen from the seat back in front of you because in a few minutes, we're going to do some numbering here and, uh, and see how this all opens up for us. There, there's salvation. That's good news. There is blessing that is good news. In verse 12, it says, For there is no difference between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly, did you hear this? And richly blesses all who call on him. There is salvation and there is blessing. Is blessing good news or bad news? Good news. Blessing is good news, especially if blessing is coming from the Lord. Amen? Like this isn't just, this isn't just like, oh, bless you. This is, this is God offering blessing. So there is salvation, there is blessing, and then get this, if we go back one more verse, in verse 11, it says that anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. There is no shame. There is salvation, there is blessing, there is no shame. And that no shame is, is oftentimes hard for us to conceive of. How is that reasonable or possible? Can we actually comprehend a life, an existence with no shame? 
It's there for us in Jesus. It's there for us in the good news we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. No shame, blessing, salvation. All three available for us. In a few moments, we're going to gather around Holy Communion, and part of the, the liturgy that we're going to hear is, uh, is, is the, the absolution after the confession. Uh, the absolution means when we are absolved of our sin through the grace we have in Jesus. And I'm going to say, brothers and sisters, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners. As we are sinners, Christ died for us. That proves God's love toward you. That proves God's love toward me. This is the good news. So we have this, this good news, this, this good news that is salvation, that is blessing, that is, that is no shame, this good news that is God's love for us. And we in that space of good news have a commissioning and a responsibility. But first, how do we receive that? I love how Romans chapter 10 articulates this, uh, this, this detail. Uh, it walks in for us in verses 11 through 13 that there is, uh, that there is action for us and that the, the, the salvation, the blessing, and the no shame is a response to this step that we take. God has taken the biggest step, the primary step, and all we have to do uh, is take a baby step of accepting that acceptance that's available for us. You see, it begins first in verse 11 with anyone who believes. I want you to underline, if you have your Bibles, who believes, believes. And I want you to put next to that number two, out in the margins, number two. Belief is number two, and we're going we're gonna to see the frame up of this argument in just a second. So, so the first is belief, that we are to believe in our hearts who Jesus is, that he, that he is our Lord, that he is our Savior, that he is God's Son, that he died and rose from the dead on my behalf, on your behalf, on behalf of the entire world, that we believe in what Jesus did for us. And then there's a second one, and it's, uh, it's reiterated twice in this verses 12 and 13. Verse 12, it says, uh, The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. All who call on him. So I want you to underline the word call. I want you to put out in the margin the number one. Underline the word call and put out in the margin the number one because we are to call on him. See, he is Lord of all. He richly blesses all who call on him, which means that, 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 that what we believe in our hearts, we say with our lips. We are to articulate it. We're to call on his name. We're to know that we are dependent on him, that we are in a relationship where we are servant and he is master, where we are offering our whole lives to him. And, and that's not something that can be done passively. It's to be done actively. We engage in our our faith by calling on his name. Earlier as we were worshiping, we were proclaiming our love for Jesus. We were, we were calling on him. And, and maybe at one of those times of prayer earlier today, you might have articulated a prayer in your heart to God the Father and Jesus the Son through the power of the Spirit. You might have, in that space and time, called on his name. That is a faithful response. We are to call on him. And that's reiterated in verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Uh, if you have your Bibles out still, underline that word call. Put out in the margin number one again. So we have number two for belief. We have number one for call and number one for call again. So, so Paul articulates these arguments uh, and, and follows through with them. He doesn't just uh, offer them up and leave them hanging. He produces over and over again, comes back to them so that we could see how they run forward for us. If you have your Bibles, I want you to look a little bit further up. It'll be on the screen, Romans 10, chapter uh, chapter 10, verse 9, we hear uh, uh, the clear articulation of what our response to God's action in Jesus is and how we experience God's saving grace for us. If you declare with your mouth, that word declare and the word call, same word. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Just two weeks ago, we celebrated confirmation, and, and I stood here in this space, and we had our confirmand stand uh, uh, behind me, and I asked them questions, the questions that are the profession of faith. And, and they had gone through a long journey, a journey over the course of a year, where they studied what it meant to profess their faith in Jesus, where they studied God's word, where they studied, uh, they, they studied what we believe as Christians, and they decided in their hearts that they believed that Jesus is Lord, and they called, they called on his name, professing their faith openly before the body of believers. This is our activity. This is our action. God has taken the step, the greatest step in all of history by offering his one and only son that whosoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. What is our step? What is our response to believe and to call on his name? We've been in this series, God's Favorite, and over the course of the last few months, I hope that, that you've heard uh, woven into every one of these messages this truth that you are God's favorite, that humanity, where we began was humanity, uh, is unique amongst all of creation, that this is God's very good creation, God's image and likeness is woven into us, that, that, that we are blessed to be a blessing, that God has, has saved us and used us so that the whole world, not an individual, not a people group, but the entirety of God's human creation is a part of this gift that we have in Jesus. I hope that you've heard that this is something that you are a part of. You are God's favorite. In the Gospel of John, there's, there's a, a pattern uh, of, of statement, that the a naming of a disciple that goes unnamed. This disciple is consistently named the beloved disciple. The beloved disciple. And, and most believe that this is John referring to himself. And some of us might think, John, why would you refer to yourself as the beloved disciple? You are one arrogant dude. Like that, that, is, that, that is, is like the height of pride and hubris that you would write an entire book about Jesus, making sure to note that you were the beloved disciple. But I believe, but I believe that it has one deeper meaning that we must grapple with. That if you are sharing your story of God's movement in Jesus in your life, you would acknowledge and be confronted with the reality that you, you are a beloved disciple. And as John writes, he writes the same thing that you and I would write if we were to write our story of salvation. Jesus loves me so much. He's changed my life in unbelievable ways. And because of what he's done in my life, I'm a beloved disciple. I might even be God's favorite. Whenever I hang out with the youth on mission trip or ski trip, they, they, they finally caught on. It took them a little while. Uh, whenever the kids were were uh, 
kind of uh, wrangling for my attention, or uh, there was, uh, th- there was a, a begging for, uh, for one of my Dr. Peppers. By the way, when we go on ski trip, I have a case of Dr. Peppers, and no one else does, and they have to act right in order to get blessed with one of my Dr. Peppers. Um, but but I, I tell them, I say, uh, I say over and over again, you're one of my favorites. You're one of my favorites. I, I, ne- I never say you're my favorite. I say you're one of my favorites. You're one of my favorites. You're one of my favorites. And the reality is, like my children, these students, I love them. And I work to love them as the Father loves them, which means that I love them as each and every one of them being my favorite. You are God's favorite. You are God's beloved disciple. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you, and our response is to call and believe. But did, did you hear this, this, this beautiful movement in verse 14 through verse 15 of Romans chapter 10? It's an invitation to response. And not only the response of, of call and belief, but to further it down the road. I, I, I love this. I'm going to read it, then we're going to go back and underline it. How then can they call on the one that, that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without? someone preaching to them and how can anyone preach unless they are sent as it is written beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news I want to go to that how statement that's the right question for us today how how will the world know how will they believe how will they call on Jesus's name how how will they do that? But I, I, I want you to be sure that, 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 that you work with me here. Uh, if you were in verse 9 and, and you saw, if you declare with your mouth, I want you to underline the word declare. I want you to put a one out in the column. And then in verse 9, it also says believe in your heart. And I want you to underline the word believe. And I want you to put a two out in the column. And then when you go to verse 14, it says how, can, how then can they call? That's number one. Underline the word call, put a one out in the column. Uh, How can they call on the one whom they've not believed in? Underline the word believe, and on the column put a two. And then in the next line it says, and how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? I want you to underline the word word believe, and I want you to put a two out in the column. You see what Paul has been doing is he's been working this through. We are uh, recipients of God's grace. We are saved uh, through, through the work of Jesus Christ. And all we do in response to God's work in Jesus is declare with our mouths, call on him, and believe in our hearts. And this is the work that's available to us and is available to everyone. And, and whenever we begin working through this path, it goes backwards. We call with our mouths. Because we believe. And remember what happens when we believe? Remember what happens when we believe in verse 11? When we believe, we have no shame. Sometimes we might think that, uh, that, that, that I don't know if I could stand before a group of people and, and say what I, uh, uh, what, what I believe in. I don't know if I could uh, stand up and profess my faith. I don't know if I could proclaim something. I don't know if I could give a, a witness. I don't know if I could share a story. But when you believe in your heart, you no longer have shame. And if you don't have shame, then you are able to be free and liberated to articulate the goodness of God. You're no longer worried about the persecution of this world. You're no no longer worried if others are going to think that you have lost your ever-loving mind. Now you are a, a woman or a man of God convicted in the truth of who Jesus is for you. And you're able to proclaim that which you believe. This movement from call to belief is rooted first in belief in order to call. These two things are so deeply intertwined. Those who call do so because they believe. Those who believe do so because they've heard. How can the world hear? They only hear if someone tells them. The world only knows about Jesus if someone tells them. 
And someone tells them if they're sent. And this is the moment that all of us rejoice that we have paid professionals that we get to send on our behalf, right? Everybody all of a sudden says, whew, man, I thought you were about to tell me that I had to say something about Jesus. God, I'm just not very articulate. I just don't really know if, if my story's compelling enough. I don't know if, if anyone really cares to listen to me. Oh, you said that no one, no, one, no one says anything unless they're sent. I guess I wasn't sent. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 28. Just flip back over in your Bibles. Matthew chapter 28 kind of dismisses the professional sent idea as an out clause to Romans chapter 10, uh, we are invited to no longer pass the buck to someone else, but to step forward and lean in. Uh, it says that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That's Jesus speaking, that Jesus has all authority. And then it gives the therefore. And, and, and part of this there, therefore you might be fairly familiar with, uh, but, but we don't read far enough along into the therefore to really grasp the holistic nature of the, the great commissioning. This is the great commissioning from Jesus. By the way, this is Jesus in his resurrected form after, after he rose from the dead. He, he appeared to his disciples many times, and then when he was in Galilee, he appeared, appeared to his disciples and gave them a work to do. This is the work that Jesus gives his disciples disciples. Anybody want to be a disciple of Jesus? This is the work that Jesus gives his disciples. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and, this is the part that sometimes we miss, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So disciples do four things. You ready? Disciples under the umbrella of, and, and get this, we'll come back to it, under the umbrella of disciples make disciples. Anybody wanted to know if they were a disciple of Jesus, ever had that question of assurance in their, in their heart, wondered, am I actually a disciple of Jesus? Well, ask yourself, am I making disciples of Jesus? Because disciples make disciples. So under the umbrella of disciples make disciples, we have four things that we do. You ready? Go. Make, baptize, and teach. Therefore, go. That's a sign of obedience and submission. We are offering our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. His lordship over our lives means that we're going to go where he calls us. We're going to enter into the conversation he invites us into. And we're going to tell people uh, that he tells us to tell. We are going to go. We're going to make we're going to make disciples. We're going to, to know that it, it might not happen in an instant, but we're going to plant seeds. We're going to invite into relationship. We're going to build relationships of trust and, and dependence uh, such that, that we all depend on the one true Lord. We are going to make disciples. Go make baptize. Conversion. Disciples make disciples. Probably a pivotal moment, uh, one of the more pivotal moments in my life was when I discipled one of my friends into the faith in high school. And whenever he came forward in my church and was baptized, I realized that I was participating, not as an ordained minister, not as anyone who was even called in the ministry yet, but I was participating in this great commission, leading someone into a professed faith to be baptized. Go make, baptize, and teach. And teach. Tell people about Jesus. This is not something that we can pass the buck onto for someone else to do. We cannot hire this out. We cannot send someone else on our behalf. If we are disciples, then we make disciples because hear this if we take Matthew 28 seriously then each and every one of us have been sent and if each and every one of us have been sent then each and every one of us have been equipped with a story to tell a word to preach I want you to rest 
firmly in this great promise of Matthew 28, verse 20. This is God's promise in the Great Commission. It's a commission with a promise. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God is going to go with you. You don't go alone. You don't go in isolation. You don't have to go in fear. You can go in strength and in confidence because God is with you all along the way. Brothers and sisters, this is our invitation. You are beloved. God loves the world. And we are the vehicles through which God is, has chosen to use his, his word to come to fruition in other people's lives. You are sent you are called to proclaim because you are people who believe in your heart and profess with your lips. And all that's left in the balance is what other people do with what they hear. And that's not up to you. And that's not up to me. That's up to what the spirit of the living God does in their lives. So let's walk in that assurance and step forward boldly with no shame, because Jesus has done that work in us. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, what an extraordinary thing it is to see how you have moved so profoundly in this, this, this internal space of our hearts, that you have uh, brought conviction in our hearts and produced a, a boldness where we profess with our lips and are prepared to articulate who you are to us. Lord, help us, help us to be released from that shame. That shame that says our story isn't good enough or our capacity is underwhelming. Lord, let all of that fade and fall away because you have chosen us, and you have sent us. Lord, let us be your people. Let us walk faithfully after you. As we continue in worship, O oh God, we uh, enter into this time of offering. We ask that, Lord, you would bless these gifts and the givers as well, that all that is done in this space and time would be to your glory, honor, and praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.